with 2,019,234. That's the total number of inmates among federal and state prisons. That's 2,019,234 that our government is paying over $27,000 a year annually per inmate. Considering the fact that our population is about 4.52% of the world population, we house a quarter of the world's inmates. That's a tad bit, uh, a little bit too much, I'd say. And it's no secret that over the past several years, overcrowding has been a major problem in our prisons. This one has many negative repercussions, whether it be shortage of supplies, that can be in the form of rooms or staff or, or a space. So for example, in Alabama, they have less than 65% of the needed workers to house all their prisons. And in addition, in some prisons, rooms that should hold two people hold up to 10. Classification errors um, can occur. Psychological effects can happen due to all the intense human interaction. And people are not getting the rehabilitation that they need. There are simply just no funds to expand. And for example, in California, uh, Supreme Court ruled that if they can't expand by 2013, they will have to release prisoners, and that's not something everybody wants. So my proposal has solutions to all of these problems. In my proposal, nonviolent criminals would be able to opt out of the second half of their sentence. So for example, if they have a 10-year sentence for the last five years, they can opt out and instead opt in to an equivalent number of years in active, active duty in the military. And I know you might be thinking, well, we don't want criminals in our military. But the fact is, we can already enlist criminals. In fact, 17% of all soldiers have a criminal background. So I'm not going to go into all the terms of my proposal, but if you read the book, they're all listed and look forward to the date. So with that, I need to remain with my time to look at the And from Florida. Um, will the individual get a say in what branch or program that they just, um, can join? Yes, they will. Thank you. Elliot, Louisiana, what is the largest age group in prison right now? Um, the largest agent in prison is between 20 and 25. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Colin Smith and I'm from Florida. Is it true that the French Foreign Legion accepts soldiers who are escapees from countries because they're being persecuted for a crime? I do not know the answer to that question. Thank you. Peterson, Republic of Texas, with regards to inmates who are already prepared, people with criminal background who already can enter the military, have they all served their time fully or are some of them still on probation of some sorts? Sorry, that's debatable. Next question. Uh, Mason Kentucky, um, would espionage be considered a nonviolent crime? That's debatable. Uh, Baker, Oklahoma, are there any other countries that have a similar sort of law? Oklahoma's government delegation is what is Wisconsin or what is the United States uh, ranking for geographical mass among other countries? For what? I'm sorry. Um, are, in comparison to other countries, are we like the one, two, three, or four largest country to geographical mass in size? Ellis, Minnesota, will this uh, clear the prisoners uh, re the rest of their sentence? Yes. Thank you. Amanda Johnson, Michigan Delegation, and Proposal for Action, it says that immigration is a nonviolent crime. What are specific crimes of immigration? Boutwell, North Carolina. Is there a limit that the military has for how many people it can enlist? Thank you. I regret so caring about me, Delaware Delegation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Do you have a statistic for how many inmates perform nonviolent crimes in prison right now? Uh, yes, I do. 1,342,791. Thank you. Thank you. Babiska Anika from the Educated State of South Carolina. Delegate, is this, does the military currently have infrastructure to train these people? Yes, it does. Carrie Yan from the Educated State of South Carolina. Is the speaker aware of how many, what percent of our federal prisons are foreign citizens? No, I'm not. Are there any more questions on the floor? The chair recognizes Lytton, Virginia, North. New Jersey, UN, New Jersey, North Carolina, Vollmer, Wheeler, Shanklin. Jeff Litton, Michigan Delegation. Do you have any idea of how many of the inmates that perform nine dollar crimes will take this initiative? Shanklin, Georgia. In your proposal, it says that the age um, barrier is from 17 to 27. What is the significance of the 27? The cutoff. Thank you, Alvin. 
Um, this man is in our Virginia Commonwealth. Is it true that the military is actually cutting back on positions due to a surplus of enlisted members? I'm sorry, that's debatable. Next question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Emma Wheeler, North Carolina. Under your proposal, if a person already serving in the military commits a nonviolent crime, what would happen? Thank you, Author. Kristen Clink, New Jersey delegation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, if someone were to receive a two-year sentence, would they be able to enlist in the military for one year? Yes, they would be. Thank you, Author. Caroline Turbo, North Carolina. Is it true that in times of war, the judge can give convicted criminals the option to enroll in the military in the jail time? Eric Moore, Model United Nations. What is the cost of these GPS tracking devices? Um, per year, the $1,730.75 Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Harrison Walmart, and I am the author part of proposal often how many thousands of U.S. citizens without a uh, criminal record were denied access to the U.S. Army last year alone. Uh, okay. I'm sorry, the time for now to be able technical questions. Texas. Uh, while I do admit that there is a problem with our overpopulated jail system, uh, this proposal does not offer a solution. In fact, I find the solution both dishonorable to the U.S. military system, while at the same time practically infeasible, and I'll go on to explain. Uh, for instance, defining what just, uh, defines an inmate as nonviolent, uh, statistics show that one in third of criminals convicted of nonviolent crimes actually have a violent history that they've not been convicted of. Not only that, but one in five nonviolent criminals after release become convicted of violent crime. Um, Moreover, what does the military standards on admission into their military services? Uh, an ex-convict with more than one major offense, that's more than one felony, is not allowed a moral waiver. You cannot join the military, period. However, if you have one major offense, you can bring forward a moral waiver and appeal to a higher court where they can decide, discern whether or not you can be accepted. The rate of this, however, as of 2010, was 1 in 10. Uh, as, as far as uh, mentally stable, which is another requirement, 50, uh, the U.S. Department of Justice said that 56% of state prisoners and 45% of federal prisoners have serious mental illness. Oftentimes that goes unrecognized in a mental stability test. Uh, secondly, I question the motivation of the inmates. Um, inmates, most, a lot of the times, will be much more interested in just simply doing their time than going to serve their country. Uh, a 15 state study shows that two out of every three inmates released are reconvicted of a crime within three years. Uh, to not paint with too broad of a brush, it seems that the majority of inmates are not looking for re rehabilitation or to serve their country. They're simply love looking to serve out their time so they can get back to their lives. Service should not be a secondary option. The men and women serving our country should be those who desire to serve our country with no ulterior motive but to serve our country. The U.S. military is a place of honor and trust. Um, I have a cousin who graduated from West Point with a 4-0, went to Ranger Academy, and graduated top of his class and then to Air Force School. His largest pride in his service is not his personal accolades, but the honor and pride and trust he knows comes with being in the military. He finds assurance knowing that he can trust the man on his left and the man on his right. These people in prison are not the most trustworthy people. In fact, they have a history of making poor decisions. That's why they're in prison. Um, the military is not a place for poor decision making, especially when a poor decision affects not just one's own life, but the lives of our servicemen. And through this, the defense of our country and the general public of our citizens. The military is not a place of honor and service and is not a second opinion to time spent in federal prison. These, these inmates already couldn't follow basic civilian laws. What makes you think they're able to follow the strict regulation of military service? I'm sorry, though, you time has left. You'll have a lot of the pro intent speaker. Which I recognize that. My name is Haley Adams from the California delegation. Russia, North Korea, Iran, and the United States. Usually, our country wouldn't even be in the same sentence as its oppressive regimes. But when talking about incarceration rates, not only does the U.S. compare with these countries, but it actually has the highest rate out of all of them. Folks, we clearly have a problem. With 760 inmates for every 100,000 U.S. citizens, our prisons are bursting at the seams. The U.S. Supreme Court has even ordered California to reduce its prison population on account that its overcrowding is so horrific, it's considered cruel and unusual punishment. Clearly, we are incarcerating too many citizens. And until we begin to change the laws that will prevent this many convictions in the first place, we need to deal with the repercussions it causes. 
overcrowding of prisons. This proposal offers a creative solution to this nationwide problem that allows for a decrease in prison population while still executing justice. Remember, these are non-violent criminals who are eligible for, to opt for military service. This includes people who have abused drugs, not other human beings. On top of this dire need for a reduction of prison population, this proposal allows citizens who have made minor mistakes to rehabilitate their lives in a way that's socially productive. Discipline, authority, and responsibility. These are the words that come to mind when I think of the United States military, and these are exactly what these inmates need more of. They are not bad people, and just like the rest of us and the rest of the United States military servicemen, they have made bad decisions at one point in their life, but they have not ended lives or inflicted pain on other human beings, and they deserve a second chance. The military would enable this chance in a disciplined environment. The previous speaker stated that one in third of released uh, nonviolent criminals enter uh, repeat crimes, but that's because they are not being rehabilitated. They are being put in, in prisons, and the military service would allow for re rehabilitation, not punishment. Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, the U.S. accounts for 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prison population. I'm sorry, Delia, your time has elapsed. You have now moved to Time to uh, mark us for Michigan. That is your right after you display your placard. While I agree with the sentiment of this proposal, I cannot support it for the action it suggests. I believe the U.S. Army is based on honor. The best and the brightest people pledge themselves to the ultimate service to this great nation. We can't, we can't create, we can't make this ultimate sacrifice as a cop out to those who just want to escape the rest of their prison sentence instead of sitting in a cell. Do we want our army, who risked every day for the protection of this nation, to be there because they just didn't want to sit in that cell for the rest of their sentence? Also, those who use drugs uh, have been shown to have statistically, um, they're statistically more likely to make poor decisions uh, and have clouded judgment. So they will be a liability to our forces. Uh, and with that, I yield the remaining of my time to Delegate Mark. This is Mark Davis, Michigan Delegation. Uh, I'd like to state the U.S. Army is first uh, cutting forces from 570,000 to 409,000 by 2017. So I don't understand why they're going to want more. Secondly, they don't want more. No one has ever published anything saying they want to accept prisoners. Last year, uh, someone asked that how many people got accepted that had a record? Zero. Because they raised their standard. In a time of war, they did allow waivers that had misdemeanors and felonies. But those people, because of that, are leaving. In California, it costs 47000 for someone in a year to go to prison. Uh, to train them, it costs 35000 to go to the army. So if they had a one-year sentence, half of that time, that would be 35000 That is more. Or if they said that would be 25000 I'm sorry, Delegate, your time is the last. Yeah. You'll never be about to... Louisiana, Colton. Um, I reserve my right to yield the remainder of my time to the office of closing. That is your right. Will the patron please yield to a possible series of questions? Will the other yield? I will. Are criminals able to enlist currently? Yes, they are. How many enlist? 72%. And how much will we be saving per inmate? Per inmate, um, a year we'll be saving $15,747.75. Okay, thank you. 17% of enlisted members of the armed forces have criminal backgrounds. So if an inmate wants to enlist in the military, why not allow them to enlist early? We will be saving immense amounts of money, and money is something we need desperately. Thank you. I yield my time. Remain in time for the observation. You have nearly one minute, 15 seconds. Is right? Okay, um, I'm against this proposal, not because I'm against the individuals who are willing to be part of the armed forces, but mostly because I think that it is not dealing with the problem correctly. Uh, right now, she, in the second paragraph of the justification, the author says that the problems with overcrowding in prisons are competition, fear of their surroundings, overstimulation, and less attention given to psychological treatment. Do you really think putting these people in the armed forces are going to deal with those problems? No, they are only going to exacerbate those problems. Also, we don't want to release these prisoners in America, so why don't we release them elsewhere and give them weapons? I think that this is an important issue, but I don't think this is the right way to build about it. Thank you, I yield the remainder of my time to deal with some of Can I give a base canonical? I do thank the chair and the previous delegate. My fellow delegates, I'm against this proposal for two main reasons. First of all, it will cost us way too much. 
I go to the Government Accountability Office. We currently pay $35 billion to train these people train our soldiers. If we increase the number of soldiers enrolled in the military, the cost will even go far higher. Today is the time in which we have to curb our deficit and decrease spending instead of increasing it. Furthermore, it's not time to use hard power and increase our, our military, because that's not what we need. Professor Freeman wrote in his book, The World is Flat 2.0 version, that the 21st century is fought with economics and diplomacy. Those are exactly the things that convince multiple countries to not react in aggressive ways. If the, if, and if the United States acts in aggressive ways by increasing its own military, it will ultimately justify other countries such as Iran and North Korea to further militarize to protect themselves from being bullied by the United States. Rather, if the United States relies on diplomacy and, and other economic tools, it's going to be far more effective than increasing their military. Basically, this proposal is ultimately unnecessary. Thank you. Right, thank you. I said I wanted to tell you a story about myself. My senior year of high school, second semester, uh, I had done a criminal for myself, and I had done a four ride to the UK, which is where I tend to get a fall. My entire school knew me very, very well. I was well liked, did well. Uh, even my teachers loved me, and I still got personal relationships with some of them. However, something terrible happened. Um, I was forced to move uh, to a location that is less than optimal. And for a while, I was biking to Starbucks to finish college application papers because at my house, I didn't have uh, a printer, I didn't have a computer, I had none of that. Uh, one night, it was rather late, and to protect myself, my mother was worried about me, so I put a knife in my backpack. Put it in there, forgot about it, never used it, never intended to use it. Probably could have used it if somebody had assaulted me, but it was in there. About two months later, I went to school. I was cleaning up my backpack, it got rather heavy from all the books that I had accumulated preparing for finals. Well, I found it in there, didn't pull it out, brandish it, found it, and said, oh, put it back. I had a substitute teacher that day, knew nothing about me, assumed the worst, and before I knew it, I was in the principal's office. I faced charges that would have put me 10 years in prison. Now, luckily, because my principals knew me, I wasn't faced with that charge. But I could be in jail right now, having served less than a year, and it's already impacted my life so much. Now, if any of you can stand here and tell me that I'm not fit to serve in the military, that is right, but I would urge you to consider me as a person first. Like myself, many of these people that are in jail are, are people just as much, and I implore you to consider that before deciding to refuse uh, and not to pass this bill. Again, I urge you, please, to vote for this bill. That is all, and I yield my hand to Thank you, Delegate. Thank you. Delegate from Ohio. That is all right. Thank you. Um, I would just like to say that when I think of the military, the first thing that comes to mind is honor, the utmost honor that anyone in America can have bestowed on them is to get enlisted in the military. Currently, however, it is extremely hard to get enlisted in the military. I know because that is my goal in life. I have gone to recruiters, I go about once a week. Guess what? There's an Air Force person there, maybe once a month. I never see a Marine recruiter, I never see a Navy recruiter. The Army guy is there a couple times a month, but that's all, and they tell me all the time, it's getting extremely difficult to get into the military. You have to be a perfect person. And while I agree with the intent of the proposal, because my father is an, uh, is a police officer, and I can attest to the fact that prisons are overcrowded, he can attest to the fact that prisons are overcrowded, this is not the way to go about it. When they get out of their sentence and they choose to enlist in the military and they have the criteria to be in the military, I'm all for that. But if they're in the if they're in prison and we want them to join the military just so we can get rid of them and get them out of the system, that's wrong. That is just, that, that's just insane in my opinion. Um, I give time to my fellow delegates. It's actually better a while. Too often in the United States, we as a nation try to push our problems off on other sources in the government. We cannot push our problems in the prison system off on the military, which just because it has a large budget and it will be not it will not be noticed as easily by the people, does not mean we should push them off. Uh, we as a nation should not give prisoners who who do not deserve the same respect as our other uh, the other people, uh, the uh, military members, and the, as a crime. Uh, also, moving right, white collar criminal, criminals like uh, con artists and such onto the into the military could actually give them a greater chance of escaping using their con artist skills. I'm sorry, delegate, your time has elapsed. First of all, I, was say, I have no doubt in my mind that the military is respectful. The thing is, I'm applying to Naval Academy and West Point as my top two choices next year. So trust me, I understand that it is of the utmost respect. Secondly, there are already criminals in the military. So clearly, 
they don't have an issue in listing them. In addition, the waiver acceptance is dependent on the branch, so it will be left up to the specific branches whether or not they enlist them. In addition, 46% have return rate, not two-thirds, but that's the fact that we need to rehabilitate. That's what I'm trying to get at. In addition, you have no clue why a prisoner is choosing to enlist for the reason they do. You cannot read their mind. You don't know what they have been through. So how dare you speak for them when they have not been able to speak for themselves. In addition, enlistment is expected to dwindle because of the incline from the recession, so therefore the funds that we be using to train them are already going to be used. And the military is a cop-out? Do you think being in the military is an easy alternative? Have you been to boot camp? Have you been to camp at the Naval Academy? No. It is not easy to say the least. Try doing seven hours of intense physical training and then tell me jail time is easy. <laughs> and to say a criminal <laughs> another crime is a stereotype. You don't know what they've been through and whether they want to change. I don't need a news article and I don't need some movie that was inspired by a true story to, to, exempt, to give an example of why this should pass, because I have my own. My best friend, my childhood brother is currently in jail for drug charges, and yes, he wrote his own story. Yes, he is the master of his faith, but do you think in the eighth grade, when he had his first beer and he smoked his first cigarette, if he could see five years in the future and know that he would be in jail, he would have made those same choices? And do you think he could have seen the look on his mother's face in the eighth grade when they took him away, that he would have let his life fall the way it did? And do you think if in the eighth grade he could see the tears in his nephew's eyes when his Uncle Rico couldn't make it to his birthday, he would have let his life fall apart? No, he wouldn't have. And the fact is now he sees his mistake and he's trying to make up for it. He is teaching himself algebra 2 and chemistry just to get meditation. He's reopened his heart to God. But he went to the therapist and he asked him for help. And you know what he said? He said, you are a bad kid. You will never change. And for Eric, and for so many other kids like him, all they want is a chance. They're asking for help. They are craving it. They're hungry. No one is giving them that chance. They fell into a hole that any of us in this room could fall into. But yet no one is willing to give them the ladder. Eric once said to me, I don't want you to fall into the same path I did. I know what I did is wrong, but I don't know how to get out of it. And the military is his way out. The military is an opportunity to perform that would allow his nephew, to allow his mother, to allow him to be proud of who he is. The military is a perform that isn't available anywhere else. The military is based on a system of codes, duty, honor, and loyalty, and that inspiration it vibrates throughout the troops, and it encourages men and women to inspire one another and to improve themselves. Have you tried carrying a comrade on your back and just waiting for your legs to give out? That is how you build friends. That is how you perform. The military gives them the life, meaning, and satisfaction fulfillment that society has ripped from them. In America, we pride ourselves on giving a voice to the needle on giving sight to the blind and giving sanctuary to the homeless, yet we can't seem to heal the broken. Forget money and forget overcrowding. This is a shining opportunity that completely exemplifies our American identity. And today, on July 4th, let's give independence to those who are shackled by the goats of their past. And then maybe one day when those bonds are broken, we can say free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Thank you, God bless. I feel my time.
The Dutch Christian community defines homosexuality as a personal choice and not a sin. Now, they're in the Netherlands. Now, maybe you can go through diplomacy and think of not only inviting um, refugees from the gay community that are being persecuted in other countries, not to just come seek refuge to the United States, but other countries as well. And with that, I yield my remaining time to the delegate from Louisiana. One minute. We're in Jackson, Louisiana. I could come up here and I could tell you that I'm support, in support of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual community. And yes, I am. But you don't care about that, do you? What you care about is the people's left hand. And I would like to say, I rode out Hurricane Katrina, and I know a broken hole when I see one. And America is not the safest place for these people. Canada, the Czech Republic, Norway, the Netherlands, we need to send them somewhere where we can... I do not want somebody to come into this country and have to see the broken look in their face when they were persecuted in another part of the world, and they come here, and they cry, and they get tortured and murdered just as they were in their other country. Could you live with yourself if that happened? Could you live with yourself? I'd like to quote Incubus. Do not let the world bring you down. Not everyone here is that messed up and cold. Remember why you came and while you're alive, experience the warmth before you die. And with that, I yield my time to the chair. Thank you, Doug. At this time, it is in order for the author's summation. Uh, the author is recognized for two minutes and 28 seconds of closing statement. Thank you, Sir Cher, and I thank you all for your really passionate debate. I found that incredibly inspiring. Um, the first argument that seems to be brought up quite often is that this proposal is somehow not feasible. But uh, right off the bat, I need to reiterate the fact that my proposal does nothing, nothing whatsoever, to change the already established refugee process and the way in which refugees, uh, refugees are admitted. If you look around this room, you would not be able to differentiate a Christian from a Muslim from a Jew. And yet, the USCIS is able to determine which religious minorities are being persecuted abroad in the same way that they would be able to determine if someone is actually homosexual or not. This is a thorough vetting process, and for that, I don't find that a valid argument. Delegate, I ask that you please speak more to the microphone. I apologize. As for the fact that this, the definition of a refugee already includes uh, the LGBT community, I would first like to say that Britain is not the United States, so that's important to keep in mind. And beyond that, that it is argued by the Human Rights Coordinator that the LGBT community is actually the most persecuted group in the world. For them to not have their own specific group within the definition of a refugee status is offensive and shows that we clearly have something against these people more than the fact that they're already included in the definition if that were even applicable. As for the idea that we, are, we should not be involved in foreign entanglements, we've been doing this. Once again, I reiterate, we have been admitting Christians from anti-Christian countries in all, since for 50 years, and yet no one has, there have been no negative repercussions because of that. I have no reason to believe that this would, this proposal would do any of that. And beyond that, these people are being killed for what, who they are. I don't think we would want to have that great of diplomatic relations with a country that's persecuting people in such an extreme way anyways. As for the idea that we shouldn't let these people come to our country because we don't have equal rights here, well, I'd like to say that I have different priorities, I guess. Call me old-fashioned, but I'd rather have my life than a spouse, and I can't help but feel like everyone in this room would agree with that. And perhaps most offensively, I cannot stand here and what, again listen to the idea that pedophilia is in any way related to homosexuality. When I just had a good friend of mine who considers himself a homosexual individual come up to the stage and say that he was hurt by those comments, I hope you all can understand that pedophilia is a social disorder. A sexual disorder. Homo uh, sex homosexuality is a sexual orientation. There is a large difference between these two groups. And with that, I cannot stand to have that argument brought up anymore, and I hope that you will not consider that a valid reason for not admitting these people into the country. Thank you, author. I'm sorry, but your time has elapsed. The motion for this plenary session is that proposal number 303 does pass.